Thank you very much. Welcome everybody to the second of uh, the seminars of the B2B I uh, seminar series. Uh, most of you and all of you know what B2B is. And um, in order to um, address the multidisciplinary nature and the basin wide perspective, which we have for the entire North Atlantic, and also considering that we are interested in um, in um, um, the uh, industry and activities taking place in the North Atlantic, uh, we uh, invited uh, various uh, uh, organizations and people to present uh, uh, their view on the North Atlantic and to widen our perspective. So a month ago, we had the ATOS project uh, talking about their Atlantic activities. And today uh, we uh, have invited uh, the director of ICS in Copenhagen to present uh, their view on their North Atlantic uh, work with regard to fisheries and advisory to the various countries, um, um, uh, ministries and governments. And in May, in one month to go, uh, we will get a lecture from an Irish colleague of us who will talk about the bioeconomics of coastal zone in the North Atlantic. And with us, I give the word uh, to Anne-Christine Pusendorf to present, um, uh, have you and give us an introduction to what ICS is and uh, what we can expect from cooperating with ICS. Please, Anne-Christine. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna share my screen um, and uh, yes uh, thanks for giving me uh, this opportunity and I have to say that the, the B2B was a, a, a new uh, creature for me and I had to look a little bit uh, into this but it, it really looks uh, interesting and I'm very happy that I've been given this opportunity to uh, uh, yeah to tell about ISIS uh, uh, and our work in the North Atlantic and adjacent uh, seas. Let's see if I can make it work. So just a little bit about uh, who we are. Uh, ISIS, or the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, is an intergovernmental marine science organization. We're dating back to 1902, and we got our legal mandate in 1964, an international convention that has been ratified by uh, 20 member countries. As you can see on the right-hand side of, uh, of this um, slide, uh, we have like four strings of, of work. We are providing a scientific platform in order to ensure knowledge creation and sharing. Uh, we are making data tools and techniques uh, available to this scientific platform. And upon request, uh, we are harvesting, so to say, uh, from the data and the science that have been created, and we are providing uh, best available scientific advice. And last but not least, we also uh, provide uh, training courses, arrange conferences and workshops. Our mission is to advance and share scientific understanding of marine ecosystems, services they provide, and to ensure that we're using this knowledge to generate state-of-the-art advice for meeting both conservation, management, and sustainability goals. As I said, uh, ISIS has uh, 20 member countries who has ratified uh, the convention. And you can see here on the globe uh, who these uh, member countries are. Uh, they're indicated here in orange. Um, the ISIS convention states uh, that the geographical area uh, of our marine scientific work is the Atlantic Ocean with a specific focus on the North Atlantic as well as adjacent seas. Um, and in 2018, uh, we applied for and obtained observer status within the United Nations uh, General Assembly, uh, recognizing, but also being recognized uh, that we have a potential uh, to contribute to various processes um, in, at a global level, uh, providing examples of how we are working. So really what you can say is that we have a global reach and that is based on how we are implementing things at the regional level. 
of course, we're working together with uh, other partners. Um, and uh, much of the work that we are doing is a result of this cooperation that we have uh, with others. And examples of this is when we talk about the Arctic, where we have a very close cooperation with our sister organization in the North Pacific, Pisces. Uh, and we also work together uh, through the working groups in the Arctic Council, uh, notably AMAP and PAME. Uh, and we also have observer status uh, in the Arctic Council. And another example is the uh, climate change symposia that we have done now. Uh, uh, we've done five of these in cooperation with FAO and uh, IOC uh, with five years uh, intervals. And as you can see here on the right hand side of the slide, we have also uh, established cooperation in the southern hemisphere uh, with ministries uh, and uh, uh, governmental agencies. Our global reach can also uh, be seen um, in the participation of experts uh, from beyond our 20 member countries who have ratified our convention. And we thus have a, a pool of uh, 6,000 scientists that are representing nearly 60 uh, different countries. And on an annual basis, we have uh, 2,000 active uh, experts that are participating in, in more than 350 uh, working group meetings and workshops that are uh, being uh, arranged uh, uh, annually. We have agreed on seven uh, science priority areas to focus our uh, knowledge building. Um, these areas are of course interrelated uh, and they are also showing progress and innovation uh, towards related societal uh, developments. And you can see these seven priority areas here and probably what you will kind of all focus on and look into is uh, seafood production uh, and the work that we are doing uh, to create both evidence and advice uh, for wild capture fi fisheries and, and aquaculture. But there are a lot of other areas such as ecosystem science, where we are looking into understanding of structure, functioning and dynamics uh, of uh, marine ecosystem. Uh, there is the area uh, impacts of human activities, uh, where we are looking into measuring and projecting effects of human activities on the ecosystems and the ecosystem services. We are also looking into observation and exploration so that it's possible for us to track changes in the environment and the uh, ecosystems. We look into emerging techniques and technologies, uh, of course, also with um, uh, aim to see uh, how we can uh, increase the scope and the efficiency of our monitoring. Uh, and then we are also looking into conservation and management uh, science, where we want to uh, provide more and better options uh, for managers to uh, help them meet uh, different uh, objectives. And as a more new area, we have started to look into uh, the sea and the society and looking into socioeconomic um, uh, aspects and where we are evaluating the contributions of the sea to uh, our li livelihoods, but also to cultural uh, identity, identities and, and recreation. And of course, it's important to say that all of these areas are uh, interrelated and not kind of treated as uh, on an individual basis. Just to give you a couple of examples uh, for the science that has been in focus uh, during 2020, I put a couple of examples on, on this slide. We've uh, started really to increase our work on uh, aquaculture. Uh, and one of the groups uh, are looking into methods to aid planning for aquaculture, uh, taking into account both the uh, uh, environmental, economic and social uh, aspects, and then dealing with the trade-offs uh, between these three uh, aspects. Um, also, when we are uh, talking about climate change and the uh, impacts on the marine environment, we are looking into the uh, introduction and the transfers of non-indigenous species and how climate change is uh, impacting the establishment and spread of uh, these non-indigenous species in the marine environment. 
and we've looked into decommissioning uh, of man-made structures and are also looking into what we call the next generation of mixed fisheries advice and how to provide uh, options uh, to managers when you are dealing with uh, mixed fisheries. As you can see, data and technology is, uh, is also one of the areas that is uh, in focus uh, and when we want to provide evidence-based uh, science. As such, we are not ourselves collecting uh, uh, data, but it is uh, important for us that we are coordinating um, uh, the data collection uh, and also that we are looking into uh, how uh, data is uh, being collected by elaborating sampling methods and protocols and also uh, planning uh, the surveys and by that ensuring that we have the most efficient way uh, of actually collecting the data. It's also very important for us that we look into data governance. We are issuing data calls uh, in order to collect uh, data from our member countries uh, and are also ensuring that there is both quality insurance and control uh, of the data that we're using in uh, our science and our development of, of scientific knowledge. Uh, New technologies is another area that we are looking into when we see that there is a, a bigger amount of data that is being collected and we need to look into machine learning, artificial uh, intelligence and big data uh, as such. And we are also uh, being uh, asked by other intergovernmental organizations to manage uh, and store their data. So basically to be a data uh, hub for them. This goes for the regional seas uh, commissions in the Baltic and the Northeast Atlantic, uh, the HELCOM and OSPA. Uh, it goes for AMAP. Uh, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, and it goes for EU. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we also have our own ISIS databases where we are uh, having data on hydrological uh, issues, contaminants, marine litter, noise, biodiversity issues, uh, and as well as commercial fish and, and shellfish. And apart from uh, there are a few exceptions to this, but uh, the main part of these data uh, are uh, available and can be downloaded uh, via uh, our website. Now, uh, ISIS also um, acts as a knowledge provider to decision makers and uh, policy formers. Uh, and we are doing uh, scientific advice to uh, intergovernmental organizations uh, and governmental agencies. And uh, these you can see on the right hand side of this slide. So this is uh, again, the Regional Seas Commission's uh, OSPA in the Northeast Atlantic and HELCOM in the Baltic. It's the regional fisheries management organizations, NIEF and NASCO, Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission and North uh, Atlantic Salmon Commission. And then uh, we are also uh, providing scientific advice uh, to EU, both to the DDMAR, uh, Maritime and Fisheries Directorate, and uh, to DG Environment, the Directorate uh, on Environmental uh, Issues. And we then also have uh, agreements with uh, three of our member countries uh, that are non-EU states, so Iceland, uh, UK and Norway. Uh, and we are providing advice both within areas um, under national jurisdiction and in areas beyond national jurisdiction. On this slide, you can see examples of it, the scientific advice that ISIS provided uh, last year in 2020. Um, this goes for uh, 182 fish stocks where we have been providing the catch advice. Um, it goes for advice that we have been giving on innovative gears, uh, where we have uh, been giving uh, scientific advice on the selectivity uh, and how to avoid uh, bycatch uh, and also uh, how to uh, use innovative gears in order to avoid that you are disturbing uh, habitat sensitivity. We have been given advice on pulse trawl, uh, where we have been asked to do a comparison uh, between the impacts on conventional beam trawling, 
bottom contacting gears uh, and pulse trolling uh, and to give advice on the differentiation between the environmental impacts of uh, these two uh, gear types. We have also uh, been uh, producing a bycatch uh, roadmap uh, with the overall goal to uh, assess uh, risks and impacts uh, of uh, fisheries for incidental uh, bycatch. And we have provided uh, ecosystem and fisheries overviews where we now have uh, 10 of each of them uh, in our ecoregions in the Northeast Atlantic. And with our ecosystem overviews, we are giving a uh, a description of the ecoregion in question, uh, of the main human activities in that ecoregion, and how these main human activities are uh, affecting the marine ecosystems. For the fisheries overviews, we are in the ecoregion giving an uh, overview of the uh, fisheries, uh, the fishing activities that are being carried out, uh, the gear that is being used, uh, and then the management of the fisheries uh, within the area or the specific ecoregion. These are the 10 principles uh, that we are using uh, when we are providing uh, our advice, when we are being requested to give scientific advice. And uh, I think that if you're gonna give an overall description uh, of what these principles uh, stand for, you can say uh, that they can be seen as an understanding that the journey is as important uh, as the destination or the process is as important as the result uh, that's coming out. And to go through these more overall, you can say that the first and main thing which is very important is that you are documenting uh, openly uh, what it is uh, uh, that you are doing, how you are coming from the request that's being given and to the advice that is being uh, provided. Also, as part of this, it's very important when you have the request formulation that you have a balance uh, between the expectation uh, of the organization or country that is uh, requesting you to provide a scientific advice and what it is that you are actually uh, capable of providing. As regards the knowledge synthesis, it's very important that you're using best available uh, science, that you're delivering it timely, uh, and also uh, that the data that you're applying, that they are, uh, you can say, following the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, we have a peer review uh, of the scientific advice uh, that we are producing, uh, and uh, when we have, um, uh, when the advice uh, has undergone this peer review, it's being agreed by consensus and it's being explained without advocacy. Now, to ensure that we are uh, both fishing at the maximum sustainable yield, but also having a good uh, biodiversity status, we need to ensure that we are making ecosystem-based fisheries management operational. And that encompasses at least these uh, three aspects that is uh, stated on uh, this slide. We need to look into uh, how um, there is an influence from a dynamic ecosystem on fisheries. So for instance, climate change will be impacting the productivity. We need to look into the impacts on fisheries on the ecosystem. An example of this is how uh, bottom contacting fishing gear is having an impact on the ecosystem. And we also need to put fisheries into uh, context with other uh, maritime activities and their uh, pressures, understanding uh, that fisheries is only one uh, among many activities and, and pressures, and we need to look into the uh, combined effects. Our ecosystem and fisheries overviews that I just mentioned for you is also one of the ways uh, for us how to deal with this and one way how we are putting this uh, into uh, a context. Another way how we are uh, dealing with this is also that we are uh, providing 
uh, advice that are dealing with these issues. This is a very busy uh, slide, but I'm going to uh, take you through it. So we have been requested to provide scenarios uh, where we are giving trade-offs between uh, fisheries uh, impacts uh, and uh, biodiversity, which is related to the use of bottom contacting fishing gear in fishing activities. And what we have done uh, giving this advice is that we have been uh, mapping uh, by the use of development and use of indicators, the sensitivities of habitats to bottom uh, contacting gears. And we have then been also mapping uh, the fishing activities uh, and uh, their, uh, each of these fishing uh, activities uh, catch values. And we have then been making scenarios uh, for how to obtain the least impact on habitats with the uh, least economic uh, impact. What's important to understand here is, of course, that ISIS as a, a scientific organization is not um, stating how uh, fisheries activities should be carried out. But together with the advice requesters, we have agreed on some of these uh, scenarios that we should be looking into. And by having agreed on this, we have then provided the uh, scientific um, advice uh, behind this. As uh, stated in the beginning, uh, ISIS has obtained uh, observer status within the UN General Assembly. And I would like to provide you just with a couple of examples of how ISIS uh, work uh, can com contribute uh, to work also at the global level. And I'm going to do this looking into uh, areas specifically beyond national jurisdiction uh, and then also looking into uh, some of the Arctic related issues. As you know, there is uh, within UN a negotiation on a new legal instrument that's looking into biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And we also have several UN General Assembly resolutions that are uh, dealing with high seas uh, or fisheries, deep sea fisheries on the high seas uh, and the protection of vulnerable marine environments. ISIS has um, a vulnerable marine environment database that is including both VMEs uh, within, but also uh, beyond uh, national uh, jurisdiction. And uh, this database is holding more than uh, 60,000 uh, records and is again available. Uh, and it's possible to uh, look into these different um, uh, records that is within the database. And the picture that you see on this right hand side is uh, a picture that that's displaying these uh, VME records in the database. Um, ISIS is uh, by NIEF uh, being requested uh, on an annual basis recurrently uh, to give advice on the uh, distribution uh, and the placement of uh, VMEs uh, and the potential overlap with fishing activities taking place in the Northeast uh, Atlantic. Um, and as you know, uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems uh, are uh, deep sea uh, marine environments such as uh, deep sea sponges or coral reefs that are extremely vulnerable to anthropogenic uh, disturbances such as uh, uh, fisheries uh, or fishing activities. So what we are producing within uh, ISIS as scientific advice uh, to NIEF is uh, maps that showing the distribution and abundance uh, of VMEs. And we are combining this uh, with maps on fishing activities uh, based on VMS and uh, logbook data. Uh, and based on this scientific advice that's being provided to NIEF, uh, NIEF is taking decisions on uh, closures uh, of button fishing activities in the Northeast Atlantic when this fisheries activities uh, is done um, in areas uh, where uh, there is VME occurrences. Um, and uh, we find that uh, these 
um, this process and uh, this information which is being carried out within uh, ISIS and which we are doing together with NAFO, uh, the North Atlantic Fisheries, Northwest Atlantic Fisheries uh, Commission, that could be a good example uh, within the UN negotiations on the new legal instrument uh, for BBNGA. As regards um, uh, the Arctic, um, ISIS has um, been uh, very active uh, within the Arctic uh, and has actually, since the start of our work, uh, been uh, dealing with work uh, within the uh, Arctic. We are just about to uh, publish a a report on the state of the uh, Central Arctic Ocean that we have elaborated uh, together with uh, PISIS, our sister organization in the North Pacific, uh, and PAME, one of the uh, Arctic Council uh, working groups. Uh, and by uh, joining uh, the work of uh, PISIS and PAME, we're ensuring uh, that we are actually um, uh, connecting, so to say, the North Pacific uh, and the North Atlantic gateways to the Central Arctic uh, Ocean. The information that uh, ISIS has and the advice that we are issuing about the fish and fisheries in the areas uh, and waters adjacent to the Central Arctic Ocean uh, is also of importance to the 2018 uh, agreement uh, that has been concluded to prevent unregulated fisheries uh, in the Central Arctic Ocean. And it's important here uh, to note uh, that in this darker blue area, that's the area that is governed by the 2018 agreement. Uh, and uh, we are within that area, in this yellow highlighted area, uh, we are giving on a recurrent advice, uh, on a recurrent basis, sorry, advice to NIEF on the status of uh, this part, this yellow part, if you can say so, of the Central uh, Arctic Ocean uh, marine ecosystem, which is within the NIF uh, regulatory uh, area. So I think basically here we're talking about a way um, how we can align, uh, cooperate and work together, especially in an area in a time where we see that climate change is warming waters uh, and uh, uh, we are seeing that uh, fish stocks are moving uh, further north due to these uh, warming waters. ISIS is also uh, providing uh, annual advice uh, on uh, fisheries uh, and fish stocks uh, uh, in the uh, Atlantic in areas beyond national uh, jurisdiction. Uh, and we are doing that uh, with methods that are developed for data limited stocks. This could come in very handy also uh, when we are talking about vast areas uh, beyond national jurisdiction uh, where uh, they are due to a variety of reasons, the vastness, uh, the uh, unexploitation of the areas has been less uh, surveying and where we also have uh, less data available. Uh, and ISIS has worked uh, on these uh, methods for data limited stocks and how to uh, provide advice on fishing uh, opportunities. Now, last uh, but not uh, least, uh, we have also uh, recently within ISIS uh, started to think about the role of gender uh, in our work. Uh, and the reason for this is that when we um, uh, look into uh, our network, uh, we find out that we have a number of women, quite a, quite a uh, large number of women that are uh, represented. Uh, but when we look into the more decision making roles, we don't see uh, a similar large number of women uh, being uh, represented. And we can only see very slowly uh, that a uh, uh, change or uh, is starting to uh, to take place and for this reason we have started to put focus on this and I think some of the pictures that you see here is a comparison with the ISIS council meeting in 1904 and 2018 and we do see some uh, changes 
And when we looked at the gender diversity in ISIS in 2019, what we could see was uh, that at the level of our annual science conference, we have an equal participation of a female uh, and male scientist, but the further up in the organization we come, uh, the less uh, women are represented. Uh, and when we come to our executive committee, our council, um, uh, we can see that uh, this is um, uh, only uh, respectively 22 and 78 uh, percent uh, uh, and 14 and uh, 18, uh, 86 percent uh, in the ratio between uh, men and women. And we likewise see uh, uh, the same differentiation when we are looking in doing a head count in 2021 uh, of the gender balance uh, in our uh, uh, scientists that are chairing our ISIS expert groups and workshops where we are having 39% women uh, against 61% uh, men. That was, um, um, I think, a, a quick look into uh, the uh, the work of, uh, of, of ISIS, uh, how we are, uh, how we have been made up, uh, who is participating uh, and the products uh, that we are producing and, and how we are, are doing it. And I would, of course, be very happy to, uh, to discuss with you on, on any of these issues. And I will stop sharing my, my screen now. Thank you, Aunt Christine, uh, for this uh, nice uh, overview into the activities in ICS. Uh, in order to give everybody who wants to uh, say something and ask questions, give the word, I suggest that everybody places uh, his, uh, his name into the chat so that I will not uh, lose the overview who wants to speak. And, uh, but I right away, I can uh, open the floor for questions and ask uh, is there anybody who wants to have a specific question to Aunt Christine, please. Hi, Paul. I have a question. Please. Hi, Aunt Christine. Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in the uh, work of this in the Central Arctic Ocean um, and the uh, fisheries agreement in particular, and the emerging conceptual framework of a precautionary approach. Um, given IC's reach and, and history, I, I wonder whether you have any guidance or thoughts um, as to how the precautionary approach um, will emerge, um, what, it, what it entails in terms of um, ob observations about both biogeophysical elements of the system as well as socioeconomic and how that becomes integrated to achieve progress with a precautionary approach. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I think that what we can see is that the 2018 uh, uh, agreement is, I guess, one of the first agreements where it's so clear uh, that you're actually putting into uh, uh, place a, a precautionary approach and you are stating that uh, you don't allow uh, fishing activities to take place uh, before uh, you have a good understanding of the uh, environmental conditions and that you have also developed a monitoring program and a, a program of uh, ensuring that you're able to actually follow up uh, on the um, uh, environmental uh, uh, status. Uh, so uh, I think that this is um, an an extremely good uh, example of uh, putting into place uh, the uh, precautionary uh, approach. Uh, La Chateau, sorry. Yes, thank you, very interesting. You have a follow-up question, Paul, please. Um, I was just wondering, I do, if it's okay for a second, Paul. Yeah. Um, in terms of the 16 year period, so there's in the, in the agreement itself, it talks about a 16 year period in which the precautionary approach would be effectively established um, so that there would be a decision-making capability at the end of that about fisheries. 
Um, I'm wondering in the context of a precautionary approach, how to build in long-term observations where the where it isn't necessarily or only focused on the fisheries, but on the entire dynamics of the Central Arctic Ocean. Yeah, I, I would say that, the, I mean, at least here you have, uh, when you're talking about the entire dynamics, I, I would think that, the, that what the fisheries agreement does that is that it's looking into fish stocks, but it's also looking into environmental uh, conditions. So uh, for that aspect, uh, you do have uh, an entire uh, uh, dynamics and, and understanding that you are dealing with a very sensitive uh, marine uh, environment and that you uh, need to deal with both fisheries and the marine environment uh, components. I don't know if that's answering uh, your question. It's a journey we're on together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lars Otto, please. Yeah, thank you for a very good presentation, Christine. ISIS has played a very poor role when they established AMAP. And um, we learned a lot from the way ISIS were arranged. And still today, three of the staff members of I AMAP has worked for ISIS before. So we had a very close cooperation and we share the database. We managed to have ISIS to expand the database, both in geographical area and also chemical topics to cover the Arctic. So what I'm wondering, if you have still the same problem as we have in AMAP, that is to have the countries to give you the data. I remember we also had the problem that there was always a good reason why they didn't report biological data to ISIS and to AMAP. And then we face national security things and private covering, some private uh, companies wouldn't share the data. So for AMAP, that was quite a big problem when we came into some of the assessments on oil and gas assessments and radionuclides, et cetera, very sensitive data linked to national interests. And that is a key problem in part of the Arctic. So I'm wondering how has that developed for ISIS? This, some of the institutes were very reluctant to hand over the data to ISIS due to quality assurance. They wanted, they didn't like to share the data with other countries that didn't have the same strict quality assurance programs, et cetera, et cetera. I think that I can talk a little bit more generally about these things and, and say that I, uh, I think that we are seeing a good development uh, in, in some of these uh, areas and um, uh, we have within uh, ISIS uh, had a very big focus on the quality assurance uh, and the quality control. Uh, and uh, also on the, uh, we can say audit trail and replicability uh, of the use of, of the data and have for this purpose uh, developed, uh, everything has its own names also within ISIS, but we call it a, a transparent assessment framework. So TAF, uh, and the idea uh, of uh, the transparent assessment framework is that it is possible uh, to see uh, which kind of data, uh, which kind of models uh, have been used and uh, what is uh, the output. So it's actually possible uh, to go in for others uh, to uh, then uh, do a similar exercise or use the similar data, or so maybe use the similar data or maybe Maybe use a, a different a model to see whether you would come to a, a, a different uh, result. So I think there's there's a lot of focus on the uh, uh, quality control, uh, quality uh, assurance. Um, I think that for some of the areas where we are now coming into, we are maybe seeing that it can be a little bit more difficult when we are moving outside of the fisheries uh, area uh, to get uh, some of the data. And maybe we're dealing with um, uh, institutes that, are, uh, uh, that have this data that have uh, different uh, requirements where data isn't uh, open uh, and where it's uh, more difficult for us uh, to align uh, uh, our holding of this data within our databases with the data policy uh, that we have and where our data policy is as a 
rule of thumb that the data is open uh, and it is uh, accessible. So there will still be some areas where there is a need uh, to work uh, further with this. But I, I think that generally what we can see is that there is a, a, a positive uh, development uh, within these areas. The next person in line is me, myself. Uh, I will uh, let the discussion go to about um, half past uh, six, my time, so another 15 minutes. Uh, I'm Christine, the uh, B2B uh, uh, research framework looks from the, let's say, from the tropics and the formation of the Atlantic water uh, to the Arctic. And um, because of that, uh, we um, uh, try to sp span over the entire North Atlantic region. When it comes to fisheries, uh, there is a significant fishery taking place south of the member states, Portugal and Spain, uh, along West Africa, Morocco, to Senegal and the Cap Verde Islands. And uh, I wonder if ISIS has any connection to this type of uh, fisheries and fishery management in the region. Well, I think that uh, while we can say that we are covering Atlantic Ocean adjacent seas, when it comes to our fisheries advice, uh, this is more specifically targeted on the uh, Northeast uh, Atlantic. And which of course also has to do with that we need to, uh, to carry out our surveys for fisheries dependent and fisheries independent data because we want to provide uh, science uh, which is uh, robust and we need to have the data uh, for that. Um, having stated that we can of course see for instance when we are dealing with eel um, that this is work that we are doing uh, together with, for instance, the uh, Mediterranean um, and the General Fisheries uh, Commission uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, we also have, um, uh, for some of our fish stocks, where we do have a cooperation with uh, some of uh, the countries uh, on the African uh, continent, but um, uh, but mainly our um, our fisheries activities are in the, in the uh, northeast uh, Atlantic region for reasons of of surveys and uh, data collection. Sure, I'm uh, I understand that, uh, but uh, maybe that I come back to you or ISIS and ask for connections to fishery organizations of the various states uh, of Western Africa, where my knowledge is uh, pretty low and I have been asking around and couldn't very not find very much uh, connections and answers. So I will come back to you on that. Yes, we will help us as much as we can. <laughs> yes. The next person in line is uh, Oestenhof, please. Um, I wonder about uh, seafloor exploration for uh, minerals, for instance. There is an increasing uh, interest uh, in that. And uh, some car companies uh, say that they want a moratorium on seafloor exploration for a number of years because one wants to, to do the science first. Um, and my question is if, if ISIS in, is involved in that, I think you mentioned that ISIS is interested in the seafloor effect of uh, fishing, for instance. But but uh, below, below the seafloor, who is which? Which international framework is actually responsible for uh, science and exploration uh, underneath the seafloor? Yeah. Thank you. Um... Yeah, as you stated, within uh, ISIS, we are we are looking at the habitats. We are looking about um, the interaction between uh, bottom contacting fisheries and uh, and uh, and habitats. And I think when we are looking more specifically into um, the resources in the uh, seafloor minerals is actually the International Seabed uh, uh, Authority. Um, we uh, we have kind of uh, established uh, some links, participated in some of these uh, regional uh, seminars uh, uh, that uh, has been arranged by the International Seabed Authority. Um, 
uh, but uh, but as such, I would say that the main um, competent uh, authority here is the international uh, uh, seabed uh, authority. Um, is that the UN structure? Yeah, that's under the um, under UNCLOS, under United Nations Convention on the uh, Law of the Sea. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a little follow-up question. Um, we are all dealing, so to say, in a in a sea which is subjected to climate change and global warming. So, with the advice and work and perspective for ISIS, what kind of time perspective uh, do you have? Do you project five years ahead of time, two years, one year? We understand that's the quota which you advise uh, people to fish, nations to fish. But what about, let's say, two, five, ten years of time? Mm. It's a very good question. And I think that we have to uh, here divide a little bit uh, into the science uh, that we're dealing and the uh, exploration that we're doing within our scientific uh, work, and then the advice that we are giving uh, and where we are being asked uh, by advice requesters. Um, and uh, I think that uh, what we see is that uh, from an advice requester uh, perspective, that there is a interest uh, on the quotas. Uh, for next year, so the fishing opportunities for, for next year. But there is work uh, within the ISIS scientific uh, groups that are looking into these forecasts uh, and projections uh, that are looking further, um, uh, yeah, with a, with, that has a, a further uh, time uh, horizon. Yes, I understand that. But uh, if I build a fishing boat, I build it for 25 years. Or 30 years. So I must have a perspective or a feeling for what my uh, right. pot potential is uh, in the 20 to 30 years time frame. And where do I, uh, if I should uh, build a ship, where do I should take that information from? <clears throat> Yes, I think that's a, a really good question. And I think that these are part also, you could also say these are part of the integrated ecosystem assessment work uh, that we are doing also because uh, fishing activities is not the only activity that's being carried out. And you can have eco regions where you are having uh, exploitations of minerals, uh, you're having uh, fishing activities, and you're having sensitive marine habitats. Uh, so there would also be a need uh, within such an eco region to actually find out uh, both uh, on a time scale, but also on a spatial scale, actually, what is the weighing in between these uh, different objectives. Um, and as such, uh, I think that um, uh, from an advice requester perspective, uh, uh, the advice that we are being requested to provide uh, is still very much focused on one area, whereas from a scientific uh, aspect, we are now broadening out uh, uh, these things and are actually capable also of providing this more integrated um, and ecosystem-based uh, fisheries uh, management. Uh, but there needs also to be these requests that are coming uh, from the advice requesters so that we can give these answers. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you have more on your own. Uh, no. Uh, the next question uh, is by uh, uh, Bob Correll. Please, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Anne Christine. Really, really very helpful. Could you just describe how you financially support not only ISIS itself, but because you have all these activities, they obviously uh, have to have a financial foundation. And how do you manage those two things, running the overall, but because you do so many things, they, they obviously take resources. How do you carry that out? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> a good question. and. Uh... Basically, what we uh, need to have is that we need to have um, the financial resources in order to support the secretariat uh, that has its headquarters in, in Copenhagen. Uh, and basically, what we are doing in Copenhagen is that we are facilitating 
uh, the work of our member countries uh, scientifically data wise and then also by providing the scientific advice and taking uh, very um, um, very specifically, what we have is that we have two strings of financing. So we have member country uh, contributions. Uh, so our 20 member countries that have signed uh, the international convention, they are paying a so-called member country fee, uh, by which we are ensuring that we can carry out our scientific work. Uh, and then we are having payment uh, from those uh, advice requesters uh, that are requesting us to provide uh, scientific advice. And what they are paying for is that they are paying for the services uh, of the secretariat in our coordination and help in producing the advice. Um, uh, and uh, then the member countries uh, are providing the experts that are taking part uh, within the work in producing the advice. Uh, so that's not being paid for by the advice requesters. But basically we have two uh, lines of, of financing, member country contributions and uh, then the payment uh, by the advice requesters that are requesting the scientific advice. Thank you very much. Um, I have no nobody else uh, with further questions on my agenda. I think I uh, bring this seminar to a close. I thank you very much, Anne Christine, for your contribution and your vision. And I'm sure that ICES, in a way, will be in uh, in our minds when we further uh, develop the B two B. Uh, uh, research framework, because whatever we will do in the future, ICES will have uh, play a role or be a part of that type of perspective which we have across the Atlantic Ocean, North Atlantic Ocean. And by that, I say thank you to everybody who participated and um, refer to the next seminar, which is in late May on bioeconomics. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I look forward to cooperating further with you. Bye. Thank you, Anne Christine. Bye. 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 Bye.